Let's take your Bibles tonight and turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we're going to read 12 verses here. Continuing in our study right now on where have all the convictions gone? And I'm going to continue or add to what we taught last week about having a conviction about language. You know, there's a lot of reasons why we need to have a conviction about the language that we use. And yet the language in modern day Christianity has gotten incredibly loose, unbelievable. In fact, last week I decided to look up um, uh, the Street Language Bible. I've always referred to it, and uh, I decided to read some of it. And I was appalled at what I read. It's actually a Bible. It's actually a street Bible is what it is, and it uses street language in describing the different stories and the historical events that are found in the Word of God. And uh, it's no wonder Christians don't have any sense about talking right and using their language for something to bring honor and glory to God. I don't suggest you look up the street Bible unless you're just really all that curious. I became uncurious after I read two paragraphs. That's all I could handle. And uh, I'll stick with my old King James, and that's just where we're going to be. And so, uh, you have your Bibles there, James chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. I will read verse 1. Please join me on verse 2. And remember last week I told you that I made a cheat sheet so that I could see the page? <laughs> I did it again. And I've got me one up here with uh, large, uh, such large letters that I can read. And uh, you watch me mess up anyway. All righty. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so... The tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And tonight I want to bring a Bible study, like I said, continuing on the theme of where have all the convictions gone. Last week a conviction about language. Tonight I want to talk to you about the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue. And so, our Heavenly Father, we come once again to the teaching and the preaching and the applying and the listening to of God's Word. And I would ask you that you would help me to do my best. And all I would ask you to do is to do your part by applying the Word of God to our hearts. Help us to be introspective. Help us, Lord, to do our best to learn from you tonight. And I ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to mark a verse in your Bible, or at least ways in your minds. Take your Bible and go back, if you would please, to Proverbs chapter 18. I'll give you time to get there because I want you to see the verse with your eyes. I want you to see the verse with your eyes. And we're going to be looking at a number of places in the Bible tonight. So if, if I were you, I would keep my Bible handy and I would turn to these different places with me so that you can actually see the words with your eyes. Proverbs 18.21 states very plainly, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. 
Now, I want you to notice this with me, and I want to show you something that you may have never heard before. The Hebrew word that God uses here for the word power is the word for hand, indicating just how much power the tongue has. If you were to take your body, like I did in this study, and I looked up the Hebrew word for the word power, for the word power in Proverbs 18.21, and with the online Bible that I use on the computer, you can copy the number of the Hebrew word and paste it in a find window. And you'd be shocked throughout the entire Old Testament, most every time the word is translated hand. Very interesting. That's right. And so what have I said about context? Context is everything. And uh, speaking of the word uh, the word power, comparing it now with the word hand, it's speaking of the great power that the tongue actually has. And just how would you define a godly tongue? We're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Godliness is one of the things that we are to add to our faith. And you, we, don't add our, we don't add anything in order to have salvation, but because we are saved, we are to add certain things to our salvation. Uh, that's what we're supposed to do, kind of like when Paul said to work out your own salvation. Getting, being saved, salvation is more than just getting saved. There's an entire life of growth ahead of us. As you know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the Bible tells us to grow in grace. And like we preached on Sunday, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So salvation is much more than just that day that you trusted Christ as your Savior. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7, it says, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Now, the word faith there, the Greek word is the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -S, if you want to transliterate it. And it's the basic faith for salvation. We're supposed to add something to our salvation, not to be more saved, not to uh, continue being saved, but to grow as a Christian. And it says this, add to your faith virtue and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, there it is, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. The words godly and godliness are mentioned 15 times each in the Bible. Very interesting. And so, uh, obviously, a godly uh, tongue is essential for God-honoring language and lifestyle. Let me say that again. A godly tongue is essential for God-honoring language, God-honoring living, you see. And so our language is to bring honor to God. It's supposed to anyhow. And so if it honors God, it is godly. If it dishonors God, it is ungodly. And this is how you define godly. People have tried to define godliness so many ways. Well, anything that's ungodly is not godly. I mean, that's the, that's the, the logic of it. it. If it's not godly, it's ungodly. Now, James uses three pairs of pictures to illustrate the power of the tongue, whether it is godly or not. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so number one, you're back in the book of James, chapter 3. And uh, I want you to go there because we're going to look at these pictures that are drawn here about our tongues. Now, there are many today, oh, what difference does it make how you talk? It makes a lot of difference. I mean, I said this the other day, I think it was last week, if I were to come into the pulpit and just cuss up a blue streak, uh, as one of our members said to me uh, on Sunday, said we wouldn't even have a meeting, I would be gone. I would be gone. And I know there's a true story that Dr. Hiles tells about a fella uh, that got into a, He got saved out of a terrible life uh, and uh, just a horrible life. And he got mad at the devil one day in his pulpit and just cussed the devil a blue streak right in his pulpit. His people sat there shocked, eyes wide open, mouths open. They could not believe the things that their pastor said from the pulpit about the devil. They were stunned in silence pastor realized what he had done. He walked out of the church ashamed of himself. Deacon in the church, God bless him. He waited a few moments and he went to the pulpit and says, now, ladies and gentlemen, what our pastor said was wrong. 
and I want you, we disagree with everything that he said. He said, but boy, didn't the devil get a good cousin. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, he did. But the pastor really hurt his testimony by what he had done in the pulpit. Now, that's a true story. Now, the next time I tell you the truth, I will let you know as well. And so we have our, our language is so very, very important as children of our Heavenly Father. So please, first of all, number one, if you're taking notes, the, the tongue has the power to direct. It has the power to direct. James chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Wow, incredible. In this passage, James compares the tongue to a bit and to a helm. What's a helm? Well, a helm is the rudder of a boat that can turn a boat. And so, you know, you've seen pictures of undersides of boats. And you see these great ships, and they might have two rudders in the back, but the rudders are relatively small compared to the size of the ship. And so, uh, these objects are both used to control and to, and, and to give direction. With your tongue, you can direct the lives of others. Yes, you can. And this is why we must be careful where we get our words. Hollywood, television, TV stars, literature, philosophy, uh, psychology, and on the list goes. There are so many sources for our language. And if we are not careful, we will use what we hear. The Christian is to have godly tongue. If he's going to have that, he has to have a godly source for his words. That's just it. But there are many today, many believers, who never even open this book. They open everything else, but they don't open up this book. This is a closed book for many Christians. I hear the phrase all the time, uh, most Christians this, most churches that. Well, I don't know if most are that way. But I do know that many are that way. And many never open this book. The word godly itself, here's what it means dictionary-wise. It means to be pious or devout towards anyone, to act or speak with reverence, respect, and to speak with honor. And that's what the word's talking about with godly here that's used in the word of God. The ungodly tongue is recognized by its impiety and the abundance and, and the abundance, oh, the, excuse me, the absence of the fear of God. And that's the way so many Christians today live. Oh, they claim to know the Lord, and I'm not one to judge whether or not they're saved, and I'm not even going to get into that discussion. If some, hey, Listen, if somebody judged me on a bad day, they might say I was lost as a ball in high grass. And everybody in this room has bad days, and you ought to thank God nobody judges you on those days. But the truth of the matter is, much of the language used by many of God's people is absent of the fear of God. The ungodly tongue reflects no reverence for sacred things and is devoid of the things religious or anything pertaining to the Lord. One man said to me years ago, so help me, Danny. He said, you mentioned Jesus to me one more time. I'm going to forget who you are and put his fist up ready to hit me. That's very interesting because his language was about as ungodly as it could possibly be. The human tongue filled with the word of God has the greatest power to direct. Psalm 1 says this, but the ungodly are not so. The ungodly are not so. Be careful about the source for your words. Now listen, I want you to see this again. Take your Bible. I looked at this last week with you, but go to Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. There is a principle here that is used in many sermons and overlooked in most of those sermons, I can say honestly. Because I don't know if I know of two people that have ever used this in their teaching and preaching other than myself. And it doesn't mean I have a corner on it. It just means I've not heard it. And I listen to a lot of preaching. I was listening to preaching before the service tonight. And I was listening to a sermon earlier today, the entire thing, out of the book of Daniel. And I was listening to it. And I listened to other people preach. So I'm not an island in and of myself. 
But look what it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. They said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's a strong statement. We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. And you see, they commanded them that they should no longer preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And they said, sorry, we can only teach what we know. Well, there are many today, I've said often, you can put a teenager, when I was a youth director, you could put teenagers into a room and listen to their conversations. And within 10 minutes, you know the kind of lifestyle that they have. The same thing's true about a lot of adults. So number one, we understand that the Bible says the tongue has the power to direct like a rudder and like a bit in a horse's mouth. Number two, it has the power to destroy. James chapter three, verses six through eight. The word of God says, and the tongue is a ball of cotton. Your Bible doesn't say that. It says your tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. Boy, here in Colorado, have you watched on the news the wildfires destroying tens of thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. Fire's destructive. And it says here, uh, it says, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents um, and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And in this particular passage, James compares the tongue to fire and, and snakes, fire and serpents. And these are both instruments of destruction. Fire consumes completely and poison kills slowly. And the tongue can do that to people's lives, not only to others, but also to yourself. Fire consumes completely, completely. Makes, and by the way, a fire will make its own weather uh, system. And uh, it's amazing how when a fire gets out of control, and we hear this every year about fires in Colorado, and they will talk about how though it created its own weather system, the fire was so intense. Well, it destroys completely, consumes completely, and a snake's poison will kill slowly. Perhaps the most common forms of fire and poison the human tongue can produce are these. Gossip, backbiting, criticizing, criticism, and lying. That's interesting. The Bible even says that a person who is affected by a lying tongue is the person who hates that individual. It's very interesting. A Christian who wants to grow should never involve himself in any of these activities, that gossiping and backbiting, criticism and lying. The old saying says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. Well, now that I'm older, I don't believe that anymore at all. Because the truth of the matter is, they can harm you, but you can heal from a broken bone. You can heal uh, from being scarred by a stick. But words, they last a lifetime. Words can never harm me. That's simply not true. In this room, there are those of you who can remember something someone said to you when you were just a young child, and it affected you for the rest of your life up until now don't need to go into it. You remember it. Every now and then it comes up in your memory. But you know, you maybe had tripped and skint your knee or maybe had a bike wreck or, or, uh, or whatever it might have been or you might have been walking through the woods and somebody pushed the limb out and it came back and hit you in the face. And maybe I remember I was on a bike hike one time. It was a 145-mile bike hike. And uh, we had uh, that morning, no, excuse me, this was the 85-mile bike hike. And I remember we had to take our tents apart. And you know those metal frames on tents? They're just destructive. And I remember that mine was stuck together. And when I pulled a prior, it snapped and hit me in the chin. I've still got a scar on my chin. And it locked my jaw. And as we were riding back, we drove by an apple orchard. And all the people, all the guys wanted to have an apple. And I couldn't even open my mouth wide enough to get a bite of an apple. I mean, that, I mean, that... But I did heal. I have a little scar, but uh, it's, it's, it's all gone. But, but hear me now. You won't forget the words that have hurt you. And not because you're sensitive or whatever it might be, but somebody actually caused damage to you. 
And so, now that I'm older, I don't believe that old saying as I did as a child because bones can heal, but damaging words can bring often a lifetime to get over. Thirdly, notice this. I said, first of all, it has the power to direct. Secondly, it has the power to destroy. And thirdly, it has the power to delight. James chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. It says, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, uh, which are made after the similitude of God. After the same mouth, uh, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. And in this passage, we find very clearly, James compares the tongue to a fountain, and then he compares it to food. A fountain and then food. And these are instruments of refreshment and refreshing and strength. And it's obvious that God wants us to use our tongues to delight others rather than destroy them. And I believe that's very, very true. But how can that be accomplished? Have your Bible there. The Bible says in Proverbs 25 and verse 11, a very straightforward statement. It simply says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The picture that God draws here is the apple refers to an orange, actually not an apple on a tree, but they were called apples. And the picture of silver is talking about a silver tray and the beauty that comes with the oranges on silver. It's really an amazing picture, something beautiful to behold. And if I have seen that in a picture form, and it is very, very beautiful. Therefore, we should use our speech to encourage and help rather than rip apart and tear down. We can do this by practicing four things. To, with delightful words. Let me give you these four things. And everybody in this room, everybody listening to my voice right now needs to write these things down or remember them. First of all, use humor. You know, people like to laugh. Laughter doeth good like a what? Like a medicine. And you know what? Learn to laugh at yourself. Make a mistake, learn to laugh at yourself. And learn to laugh with others, but use humor. You know, that's a delightful thing for a lot of people. Humor. Uh, and then... Use your words as a thing of encouragement. Did you know an encouraging word is um, encouraging? <laughs> Did you know that? I say that's why they call it an encouraging word. I think I just heard a discouraging word. Now your skies will be cloudy all day. Is that it? No, I think I just heard an encouraging word. And the truth of the matter is we need to use our words to encourage people, you see. I think about um, your testimony, your testimony, sharing a testimony about anything that God has done or a blessing that you've received or something you've been able to do for the Lord. By the way, how can, what is the difference between praise and pride? Think about that. The difference between praise and prize. Well, you stand up and you praise the Lord. That's good. You get up and praise yourself. That's, that's bad. But a lot of, there are many Christians today who don't know the difference between that, you see. But we use our testimonies to encourage someone else along the way. And another thing to do is this, and that is use song. And that's whether you can sing or not, doesn't matter. I think back to Mother's Day, 1973, a day of infamy for me. A day I will never forget as long as I live. I grew up in Indianapolis, and that's right in Tornado Alley. They, there's a lot of places they may refer to that, but Indianapolis, Indiana, is smack dab in the middle of Tornado Alley. And on Mother's Day, there was a line of tornadoes that crossed the state of Indiana right across my home church. And I remember that uh, as we were getting ready to leave that day, we, were just, we had just dismissed from church, and one of the men in the church yelled back in the church, tornado, everybody back inside. There's only a few people outside, and only one person, uh, a lady, uh, got hit by a piece of debris on the upper part of her arm and had a small injury, just a small tiny scratch that bled. A two-by-four was thrown through an automobile that was in the parking lot, and our Sunday school annex was picked up and moved a mile away and destroyed into a billion pieces. The roof of our church was lifted 
the, I mean, the, the, not the ceiling, the roof, the outside roof of our church was lifted and moved two and a half inches. The stone sign out front was completely destroyed. I remember my pastor picked one of our teenage girls up who had started to run out the door. He picked her up by her arms and threw her to the center of the auditorium. I remember I hit the floor and I'm down and glass is flying everywhere. They called it the Mother's Day Miracle because of only one person getting a small scratch on her arm. My hair was and my clothing was filled full of broken glass. See, were you scared? Well, I was a pretty upsetting moment in my life. I remember that one of the teenagers, in fact, it was the one that the pastor picked up and threw to the center of the auditorium. She was an adopted child, and her parents lived a number of miles away, uh, and they saw the tornado hit the church from their house. And I remember what, what her mother said. She said, oh, my baby, oh, my baby. And she watched that tornado pick the roof of that church up and move it and watched it destroy the annex and all the rest of it. It was an incredible day. Say, was everybody scared? Oh, pretty much. If you can only imagine in your mind what it would have been like. Well, how were we encouraged that day? My youth director, he stood up in front of the church and everybody's, there's a number of people were crying and everybody was afraid and a lot of people were hugging each other. And he just started singing. And he led all of us in song. Took our minds kind of off of what had just happened. But that's what he did. And he was a singer. He, he sang a lot. He, my youth pastor taught me a lot of the courses I've taught you and things like that. But using song to encourage someone, you can use your song to encourage people, you see. I thought about tonight's Bible study, and I thought about what we were going to sing for the first song, and I thought Mansion Over the Hilltop, and I thought I want to play my guitar, and I want the uh, piano and the, and the organ to play, and I want to play with them, and, and, I, and I want us to sing and just have a good time on Mansion Over the Hilltop. And you did. That's exactly what we did. It was a lot of fun. And I played my guitar, and you played the piano, and you played the organ, and we all sang together on a great old song. But to me, that's encouraging. You ever wonder why sometimes I come in on a service and we sing, everything's all right in my father's house. You think I'm just nuts for doing it, I know. I'm nuts for other reasons, but not that. Why do I sing that? Because I want you to remember that everything's all right. We're living in a time right now that's not very encouraging in our country. We really are. We're living in a day of great compromise in Christianity. We're living in a day of great compromise in our country and destruction in our country. But I want you to know when you come to church, everything's all right in my father's house. I do that on purpose. Now I've let my secret out, but that's why we do it. And so my youth pastor encouraged the rest of us. And that brings me to a conclusion to tonight's Bible study. This does not mean that a person should never say anything negative because sometimes that which is negative builds us. We do not like to hear negative things about us, but hearing the truth without criticism is something that edifies and builds us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, it calls what we speak in praise the fruit of our lips. The fruit of our lips. I don't have anything to praise God for. Yeah, you do, you sorry thing. You got, all, you got your salvation. You've got the fact that you can still take a breath, that you can still walk. None of us are completely healthy in this room that I know of. In fact, I've never met anybody that was totally and completely healthy in every area. But we have a lot to be thankful for. We really do. So when I think about this, after considering these pictures of the tongue, Number one, a bit in a helm. Number two, fire and serpents. And number three, fountain and food. The believer has got to realize that he cannot permit Satan to use his tongue. You see. True story out of the life of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I may, get a, I, I may get a little bit of the story not exactly as accurate as it ought to be, but a woman had apparently spread some pretty nasty gossip and criticism about Charles Spurgeon. And he pastored a big church. Well, the woman realized that she was wrong. And she came to the pastor and she asked Pastor Spurgeon if he would forgive her 
for the criticism and the negative things that she had said to all the people that she had talked to. He didn't say a word other than follow me. And he went and he grabbed uh, one of the pillows that was there at the church and, and he took her to the top of the church building and he cut it open and he just let the, all the feathers go out of it without saying a word. And she said, why are you doing that? She said, what you have done is like what I've just done by letting all these feathers go. She said, you'll never be able to get those words back. Ever. You can be forgiven, but you can't get the words back. It's impossible because she had spread it to a lot of people. And you know how it is. It's like dropping a ping pong ball in a room full of set mouse traps. You drop one ball and poof, the whole room explodes, right? And that's the way a lot of it is. So just how would you define a godly tongue? A godly tongue is essential for God honoring language and lifestyle. And if it honors God, it's godly. And if it dishonors God, it's ungodly. And that's how you define godly. You remember the scripture song? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. O Lord, O Lord. O Lord, O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Shall we stand?